Unbelievable Truth. Slightly different title to the kind we normally have and, and one which I hope might have got you thinking about what on earth I might be talking about tonight. You well, normally think. when we talk about the truth from this platform, we're talking about the, the truth of the words contained in the Bible. And to those of us who believe, that is something that is very precious to us. And it's something on which we place a great deal of, of weight. But there are many, many, many people in the world who can't take that step with us. They can't share that belief that we have in these words. There are many, even people who, who are Christians, who say, but I can't quite believe everything that is in there. We have to interpret and, and take certain elements of it and certain bits we, we're not going to worry about. As human beings, we're, we're, we're riven, aren't we, by doubt. Well, is, is that really what it means? And so I want to try and address this tonight. So I want to find a different truth. Okay, nothing like a, a bit of Latin. I don't really know what any of that means. So I'm going I'm to find a truth that everybody in the world can agree on, can believe in. And even though we doubt... So I, I do know what the words mean because I looked them up. Okay. Dubito ergo cogito ergo sum. Don't correct my pronunciation. Beth's got her head in her hands. I doubt. This is Descartes, by the way. Now, if I doubt, I can doubt everything. But the fact that I doubt means that I'm thinking. Okay? I doubt, therefore I think. And I'm sure you can finish the rest of the phrase. Therefore I am. Okay? Normally we cut that down. We talk about I think, therefore I am. The fact that we're here, the fact that we're thinking, the fact that we can ask these questions, even if we can't consider any of the answers, say, well, I can't believe that. We know that we exist in whatever form. So let's just start with that. We can just agree on that in the beginning, that we all exist. Let's contemplate our own existence. And what would be required for that to occur? Now, before I move on to the slide, I just want to set out my stall, if you like, what I hope to prove, or at least get people thinking about, is that however you choose to believe that we, as thinking emotional beings, came to exist, you're going to have to make a leap of faith somewhere. And the, the step of faith that, that we, uh, as Bible believers, choose to make is no greater. In fact, given more time, we could say well, we feel it's more rational than some of the other leaps of faith that, that people make. So in essence, to have thinking creatures, four things I suggest have to happen. First, a universe has to be created. Secondly, there has to be order within that universe. There have to be atoms and molecules, stars and planets. Third, Life has to be created. Life has to come from somewhere within that universe. And fourthly, from that life, one of those life forms has to become intelligent. It's no good if it all just remains as algae. One of those life forms has to become intelligent so that we can ask these questions. So that we can build computers and put together PowerPoint slides and all these things. How does this universe, this world that we inhabit, where we exist and, and things exist, come to be? So let's start with the first of those, the creation of the universe. This is a very standard diagram that, that we have, showing that the, the picture of the Big Bang. And we can see there, at the end, the universe that we live in, the galaxy with stars and planets, and it goes back and back in time before there are any stars 
through this period of, of inflation that we, we could talk about, given more time. What I want to look at, though, is right at the very beginning. What was the blue touch paper? What kicked off the whole thing? Quantum fluctuations. And I'm sure you're immediately saying, oh, I know what quantum fluctuations are, but I'm going to go over it anyway. See, the thing is, in physics, there's this thing called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And what that means is you can never have, at a tiny subatomic level, complete certainty. You can never know exactly where things are and, at the same time, how much energy they've got. And there's all sorts of effects in our world, things that we've created, where we can see this effect. It contributes to things like part of how an MRI scanner works. And so the theory goes that before there was a universe, or matter, or space, or time even, there were these little quantum fluctuations. Because you can't have no space and no energy, because then you know everything there is to know, and, and we can't have that situation. And you can even have, I've shown two curves there, one of a, a fluctuation that's quite narrow, so we know where it is, and quite tall, okay, so we know where, we don't really know that much about the energy. <coughs> or we can have one that's got quite a low energy and is quite broad. And the theory goes that because there is no space, you can actually end up with one of these fluctuations that's infinitely small, infinitesimally small, but has an infinite amount of energy. And that's unstable, so that explodes and kicks off the whole of the Big Bang. But that can bring about all sorts of questions, can't it? For a start, this was before time existed, before space existed. So in what medium were these little fluctuations occurring? And if there are, if it can all come from nothing, well, there's an infinite amount of nothing, isn't there? And so that can, are there then an infinite number of universes? However, if there is, even though this might be infinitesimally possible, the chances of it happening are so absolutely microscopic, if you've got an infinite length of time, then... Crazy things like that can happen. Right. I want you to imagine... I've got a little pound coin bounced on the screen there. I haven't actually got a pound coin. I do apologise. If I had a pound coin, an imaginary pound coin, OK, and I'm just going to place it on the corner of the table just here. OK. Now, in this wood are all the atoms bouncing around, vibrating. OK? Because nothing's still. Everything's vibrating. OK? And I want you to believe me when I say it's statistically possible that all those atoms in the piece of wood would all vibrate at exactly the same time, so they all move upwards at the same time, and that coin could just spontaneously flip up in the air. OK? Statistically, it's possible. Okay, even though there's maybe a billion atoms, tens or whatever atoms, touching that coin, statistically possible, they all vibrate upwards at exactly the same time, and that coin would flip. Now, if I had that coin there, I want you to imagine how long you'd have to stand and watch that coin in order for it to spontaneously flip over, because all those atoms happen to all move in the same direction at the same time. Now, if you had an infinite length of time... Infinitely impossible things happen. Okay? And this is the kind of, of level of statistics that it's suggested maybe started the Big Bang. Now, there's another theory that actually having nothing is completely unstable. You can't have nothing. So the instant there was nothing, then the Big Bang was inevitable, and it had to happen. But again, that brings about questions. Well, how come the nothing just started there and then? Because if there's been nothing since forever, surely the universe would be older than that. There's a lot that people, even those who, who believe in the Big Bang, don't understand about how it all started. 
Let's think about the order of the universe. When you get down to the, the fundamental physics of the universe, there's all sorts of parameters, strengths of forces, the speed of light, and all these things. And what this graph here shows us is along the bottom is strength of electromagnetism. So that's one of our forces. And across the top is the strength of the strong nuclear force. That's the thing that holds atoms together, or uh, nuclei together. Okay, got to get the physics right. Okay. And what you see is if electromagnetism is stronger than it is now, we see that atoms just won't hold together. Everything's radioactive, everything disintegrates. So the kind of universe we have, where molecules can build up and, and life can exist, just isn't possible. And if the nuclear force isn't exactly the right strength, then stars can't exist and, and everything just gets swamped by gravity. Now this is just two parameters. So what you see on there is there is a tiny fraction of that graph where the universe that we have, where there's structure and life can exist, is a tiny fraction of that graph. Okay? So it's possible, if the universe was created by a big bang, that for every thousand universes, only one is capable of holding structure, even molecules or planets or life. Okay? And that's just two of these values. There's actually a whole host of these values that need to be exactly the correct value in order to get the kind of universe that we have. What about the creation of life? So th this is a, a graph wh which shows what is believed to be the, the formation of life. So you start off with, with the Earth, and then you get water and oxygen and nitrogen, the kind of atmosphere that we have now. And in this atmosphere, organic chemicals can begin to form, and eventually they can turn into something called RNA. Now you know DNA is this double helix, incredibly complicated molecule. Okay, Well, RNA is just one half of that. And our bodies use it as a working copy of the DNA when they want to build a new cell. Our bodies don't routinely use the DNA. They only get that out very rarely when they're creating new cells. Normally, day to day, they use this thing called RNA. And RNA is simpler than DNA, although still quite complicated. And so it's thought that the RNA existed first, and then over time, that eventually ended up being the DNA, and then there was life. But again, we haven't got the time to go over it. There's all sorts of problems about this. How is it that DNA is special because it can replicate within a cell? The fact that there's two strands to it means it can unzip, and then each strand can create a new side of a zip, and then you have two. You have two cells. It takes DNA to replicate. RNA is just one side of a zip. It can't replicate. If it could exist, it could do amazing things. But it can't replicate. So how can a, a process like evolution begin to work if you've only got that one side of the zip? And so there's all sorts of problems. And even problems like, how do you get this RNA just appearing and there was a news article not so long ago that said Earth life may have come from Mars because actually the kind of minerals that you need in order to enable these reactions to happen aren't in the right quantities on Earth, but they are in the right quantities on Mars. And so the theory goes, well, maybe all this happened, all this RNA soup existed in Mars, and then there was some collision with an asteroid and a piece of rock flew from Mars, came through space and landed on Earth. And then when it landed on Earth in the oxygen and nitrogen rich atmosphere, it then took off and grew. Okay. Again, and you know, this is a, a sound scientific theory. Now the odds of this occurring are tiny. Okay. Intelligent life. Yes, on how many animal species there are. No. Uh, if you look at total species of anything, it's about 10 million. And of all of those, 
how many species on the planet have the same level of intelligence as humans? One. Okay. So you can see the odds immediately that there's a, there's a one in 100,000 chance of a major animal, okay, so we're not going to include the slugs and the worms and the things like that, of a major animal having intelligence. And so it's equally possible to believe that had these things happen spontaneously, you might end up with planets that are full of life, but nothing intelligent, just plants or just algae or all the rest of it. And then, of course, there's also a, a leap of faith to be made about the kind of intelligence that we have. Because it, it's believed that the intelligence that we have came out of, of survival instincts. The need to survive, that's the way evolution works. So we are asked to believe that the most beautiful things that we have in our world, the most sublime and meaningful art and poetry come from just our need to survive, just our, our need to attract a mate. Like the weaver birds that sort of build their, or bower birds, isn't it, that build their, their bowers to attract a mate. And, and, you know, you extrapolate that over time and it becomes distorted and becomes art as we know it. The most beautiful music that you've ever heard is just a distortion of language. I find that hard to believe. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of a cyclist giving a drink of water to a thirsty koala. Apparently there was a very hot spell, as you know, in Australia. The koala's actually got to the point of going up to people and asking for water. Why would you do that? But human beings do. We have this within us, this, this desire to help people. It's called altruism. Where we can help people for no gain whatsoever for ourselves. We had that poor chap, didn't we? I remember a um, disabled chap who had his car wrecked by vandals. And people from all over the country poured money in to help this, this gentleman. They knew nothing about him. And yet they desired to help. The kind of intelligence that we have exceeds that required for simple survival and, and reproduction. Now all of, of the things that we've discussed relate to something that's called the, the Arthropic Principle. And if I'm honest, it's a bit of a tautology. So a tautology is just saying, you know, almost something as profound as 1 plus 1 is 2. It's something that's obvious. But it says, the universe that we have must exist in such a way that it can support life because we are here to observe it. Okay. You know, there may be universes that, that don't support life and nobody knows about them. A bit like if a tree falls in the forest, who can hear the sound? But our universe has got us in it. Therefore, our universe must be capable of supporting life. And yeah, that, that's a tautology, but actually how did that come about? Yeah, so the odds of there being a universe capable of supporting intelligent life? The trick question, all right? Because what are the odds of there being a universe that has intelligent life in it? I'm sorry, it's one. Because we're here, yeah? It's a guarantee that intelligent life exists in this universe. Okay, I can see that just from looking at the room. Okay. <laughs> so how did that come about? Were there lots of throws of the dice? Ten with 175 north throws of the dice? So that it becomes more likely? Well, it's possible. And we'll talk about that. Maybe science is different to what we think. Maybe there's some really fundamental things that the scientists haven't discovered. In which case, all the science that we have that builds up the picture of the Big Bang and all the rest of it is actually wrong. Okay? Or maybe it's not statistical at all. So we talked about the, you know, the many throws of the dice. There are people who believe, and it's a genuine scientific theory, that there are in fact an infinite number of universes. And if there's an infinite number of universes, you get an infinite number of rolls of the dice. And so the fact that you only get one life-bearing universe every ten to goodness knows how many noughts, well, there'll be an infinite number of those. Every single possible universe capable of supporting every single possible form of life exists. And this is a a credible scientific theory.
and yet belief in God isn't. Now, if you can believe in every possible form of life in an infinite number of universes, then surely belief in God is possible within that. But the point I want to make is that we have certain facts, and the only fact that I really presented to you tonight is that you exist. And we have to try and make something of that. We have to try and understand something from that. And every step from fact to belief requires a leap of faith. And don't let anyone try and pretend that it's all done and dusted. It's all known. Because it's not. People might say, well, yeah, I do believe in an infinite number of universes. To me, that's a leap of faith. To believe that there's an infinite amount of matter, an infinite amount of energy, an infinite amount of, of information. I find the physics of that hard to believe. Or they might believe in statistical miracles, that these incredibly unstatistically likely statistically unlikely it's better English things that can happen such as the, the creation of the universe or, or the existence of life that these did just occur and we were very lucky with the dice there is the possibility that, that actually we just don't know the science that's required to understand the universe just hasn't been discovered yet but what we have would have to change significantly it is a leap of faith to believe in a creator God. I understand that. And we'll go on to talk about that more in a minute. Do we believe in spontaneous creation? That, that things could just happen by themselves? Or many people just don't think about it. I'm just getting on with my daily life. Somebody else tells me that this is what I should believe in, so that's what I'm going to do. And that in itself is a leap of faith. Because you're putting your trust in somebody else. Well the scientists have got this all covered, I don't need to know. Now this is a Bible talk and we haven't opened the Bible yet so let's ask the question what does the Bible teach about belief? The first thing I want to say is we don't know everything. Let's look at Job in chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone. And as human beings, we we're always tempted, aren't we, to, to believe that we can find out everything. And the Lord says, you won't know everything. Were you there? You're just making guesses. <coughs> he says, he was there. The Bible gives us the answers we need to know. But it's not going to tell us how God made the universe. We just have to trust in him. Because God does want us to trust him. And we see that all throughout the Bible. Turn to the New Testament. In John chapter 20. Now in this, this passage occurs after Jesus had, had risen again from the dead. And one of the disciples, Thomas, when he was told this by the other, said, I'm not going to believe it. I won't believe it till I see him for myself. And I see him with my own eyes. Verse 27 of John 20. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. 
Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The Lord Jesus there is looking forward to people like us. People who've got no hope of physically seeing the risen Lord Jesus before us now. So we can touch him and see the, the harm on him. And yet still believe. Those who, who cannot see the, the very equations and the methods by which God made the universe. And there's still unanswered questions. And yet still believe. Those are who are blessed. Over to Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen. Which were not made of things which are visible. That tells us. That we understand God made the world, not because he's laid out the evidence for us, but because we believe, because we have faith. In fact, he's saying the things which are seen, the things that are around us now, were not made of the things which are visible. We can't trace back the evidence. Because it was made at the, with, by the hand of the mighty God. Now, following God will run contrary to human wisdom. And there's no getting round that. We might wish to, to argue and debate with people and say, look, using all your science, what we believe is totally rational. And we might believe that. But they will not. If we turn to 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Belief in God is foolishness. In the eyes of this world around us. And there's no getting round that fact. And we might want to wish to hold on to both. To follow God and appear wise in the eyes of the world. But it just can't happen. Turn back a page to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 26. For you see your calling brethren. That not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty. Not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. God asks Humility and trust of those who will serve him. Not lifting themselves up by having grand theories. Those who would follow God must be willing to appear foolish. And finally, discipleship is not an intellectual exercise. If we turn back to Matthew, in chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Following Jesus is not about being smart. It's not about having the answers. It's about simple acceptance of the, the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings of the Bible. It's about giving up your own pride and following the Lord Jesus. 
And then turning to Peter's second letter, this passage speaks to us about what God is looking at in those who will serve him. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So what is the knowledge of God? Is it head knowledge? As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which having been given to us exceeding great and precious promises. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, of his character. <coughs> the unbelievable truth. So even going back to our starting point, I ask you to accept no other truth than that you exist. And to think through the implications of that. Of how a universe could exist in which you exist. To think about how it is that you exist. And each of us, as we try and answer that question, has to make a leap of faith. And I would say that each of us has the responsibility to think about that. And not just pass that over to somebody else and let somebody else... Make that leap of faith for us. And the Lord God asks us to make that leap of faith towards him. And to trust in him. And if we do so, he will welcome us. And he will call us his own. And that is a wonderful truth.